So I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, um, what we are, what this gem is about, and how we're th why why we're thinking about this problem, and a little bit how we're thinking about this problem. So it's about this coevolution of state capability and and economic development, as Ellen said. And you know, in intellectual history, there's a, there's been a way to think about it. The first one is, is starting with this bearded gentleman here saying, you know, in the beginning, there is the way it, production happens. And the way production happens leads to a certain way in which people relate in production. The mode of production determines the relations of production. And, and the relations of production then require a political superstructure to, uh, to manage it. So that's sort of like that was one current. Uh, an alternative current, uh, you know, pioneered by Douglas North and, and developed by Ajemoglu and, and Robinson, and Jim Robinson is going to speak later uh, today, um, in, in a way advancing, uh, you, I'll talk about his next book. Um, but in their, in their basic work, they sort of like inverted Marxist logic, saying no, in the beginning there are institutions. Institutions determine the structure of incentives. The structure of incentives determines the incentives to acquire technology, and technology uh, ends up causing economic development. So in the beginning, there were the institutions, sort of. You know? um, we've covered a lot in previous gems, and I'm going to sort of like review a little bit at least our approach to development and, and things. And we said, uh, and I'm going to mix that previous story, the prequels, uh, to, to the theme of, of today. So, you know, we said that, you know, economic development is about uh, technology adoption and that, you know, the reason why some countries are rich and others are poor is, by, is because of the way they do things and the way to do things in the world is what we call technology. But technology is really three things. Uh, technology is, tool, is tools. Uh, technology is codes, recipes, protocols, how to do manuals, and technology is know-how. Know-how to use those tools, know-how to follow the protocols and mix it with something that is neither tools nor, nor protocols, but something that resides only in brains. So uh, tools are easy to move around. Protocols, codes are easy to share. But what's really hard is to get know-how into brains. Uh, but the know-how that is required by technology is not just you know, a, a high or low, a little or a lot. It's, it's very specific because there's a deep division of know-how in, in the world. Um, you don't say that uh, this captain knows how to fly this plane because the plane is not an individual action. It's a team action that requires a lot of complementary uh, uh, bits of know-how that have to come together. And this need to disseminate know-how in different heads and then bring Humpty Dumpty back together again is what gives economy, the economy its complex structure. That is something that we like to study. So, you know, production is a little bit like putting a symphony together. Everyone goes to the symphony with a different instrument and, and the whole needs, needs to make uh, sense. And that's we all brought together with this uh, teaching aid, if you want, uh, this metaphor of production being like a game of Scrabble, where products are like words. They're made by putting letters together, and letters are these productive capabilities, these, these bits of know-how and so on that have to, have to come together. Uh, so, you know, as we've said in the past, and you've seen these slides before, you know, with one letter, uh, there aren't too many words you can make. With these three letters, you make four words, and you can make four-letter words. With four letters, you make these nine words and four letter words with these 10 letters. According to the Scrabble website, you can make 595 words. And if I give you the 26 letters, you can make the whole dictionary, right? Which are several hundred thousand words. So, so the idea is that as you increase the, the variety of know-how you have in your society, you can do more things. You can become more diversified and uh, you can make longer words. You can make more complex things. So when we go back to this picture, what we observe in some, some sense is the difference in the know-how that is being utilized. The guy on the left, he uses his own seeds, he uses his own bulls, he uses his own tools, he uses his own dung as fertilizer. He, 
etc. He knows how to repair these things. The guy on the right uh, you know, knows how to drive that harvester, uh, but that's pretty much it. He doesn't know how to make a harvester. He doesn't know how to make the gasoline that the harvester uses. He doesn't know how to make genetically modified seeds or the fertilizers or anything, but somebody does. So he's just this letter in a very long word, while the other guy is a very short word, right? So that's sort of like the difference in what you're seeing here. It's in some sense in, in, in the amount of know-how that is getting mobilized and consequently in the network, the human network that underpins production. So how do get, letters get together? How, how does this happen that letters get together? Well, uh, we know that there's something called the invisible hand. It was hard to get a picture of an invisible hand. <laughs> okay, but the invisible hand really has a, is, 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 you know, Adam Smith was probably the first complex systems thinker. He thought the economy has a capacity to self-organize. And the economy has a capacity to self-organize because it really has three things. It has prices, which is a source of information, as you know, Hayek taught us. It has profit-motivated firms that uh, respond to those prices. And prices, for example, include the prices of the things you're going to sell and the prices of the things you need to buy in order to sell. So profits are a function of those prices. And then you have capital markets that are there to find who's going to be profitable to lend them money so that mobilizes resources to those that are expected to be profitable because they are a, a trying to respond to the information that is in prices. And that's sort of like the invisible hand that self-organizes the economy. So, so if that's the case, who needs a state? Who needs a state and why, how do you bring the state in? What, what is the state for in this framework? So well, you know, a technology needs a lot of public goods. You can buy a car, but a car to be useful needs roads, needs traffic lights, and maybe a cop that you know, organizes things around. A, you know, electricity needs standards, as you know, any business traveler knows, a, and you know, needs property rights to cross over other people's lands with uh, transmission lines and stuff like that. A, cell phones need property rights on the spectrum. No, so somebody has to allocate property rights on the spectrum. Newspapers need standardized language and you know, a, a public that knows how to read. Right? So you know, manufacturing needs a tons, of, tons of things for it to be able to happen and many of these things involve, involve public goods. So to the point that you know, the British are finding out that leaving the European Union is a little bit more complicated than they thought, right? Because uh, there is a European basic law that has 30, I don't, can't read the number, 30 some chapters, and you can read the 36, 35 chapters, according to my slide, that has 65,000 pages of legislation, just the basic law. And then obviously implementing it in each country involves millions of pages of legislation, thousands of government agencies, and so on. So that's sort of like the texture of the society we live in. So back to Scrabble. How do we so like tell this story back in Scrabble? Well, eh, there are, if you want in production, some letters that you can buy in markets. And eh, those letters that you can buy in markets, maybe think of them as consonants. But there are other letters eh, that are only provided by states. They're public goods. They cannot be privately provided. They are only provided by states. Think of them as vowels. So production really it requires you be able to put together the consonants and the vowels, the private goods uh, and the public goods. Right? Now, the private goods have this invisible hand of the market. How, what is going to, you know, suddenly somebody invents a cell phone, what's the process whereby somebody's going to create property rights on the spectrum. How does that happen? So the public goods are not necessarily self-organizing. They are not self-organizing because precisely they have no price. You know, they have no price. Their central park has no price. Uh, there is supposedly no profit motive. It's not the judge makes a, a decision based on whoever pays him more, right? At least it's not the way it's supposed to be. Okay? 
And uh, there is no decentralized capital market that is saying for education, yes, for uh, military spending, no. Right? There's a centralized budget process where resources get allocated. So while the, the, the consonants have the invisible hand, the vowels have a more complicated problem. Right? The vowels, where do you get the information? Well, maybe in the US, you get, in the politicians get the information through lobbying. People organize, they lobby, and so on. And OK, but what's the incentive for politicians to respond? Well, in the US, it might be campaign contributions. Right? That, uh, that makes, uh, and it may not be the most efficient or, or the, the best way to necessarily influence uh, the incentives. And then, you know, you want to buy influence over the allocation of the budget. Right? So this is not uh, the beautiful invisible hand that organizes uh, the consonants. And as a consequence, it may be very easy for uh, uh, countries to get stuck in the provision of public goods. Okay? Now, uh, we can imagine that some public goods leads to private investment, because now, now you build a road, now the place is connected, so economic activity can happen there. But it could be that economic development creates demands for public goods that eventually are supplied. Or that security it creates the underpinnings for there to be economic activity, or that economic activity creates the demands for security. So we uh, wrote a paper we published this year. We published this year. It took us five years to write it. But, uh, and what we did is we downloaded uh, the websites of 53,000 uh, US state government agencies. And this is the network of websites of the 50 US states, um, uh, the 53,000, uh, and they're linked by hyperlinks, by the hyperlinks in the website, so it, which tells you sort of like what things are relevant if you're here, what other things are relevant to you. Uh, by the way, that, that red thing at the bottom is Massachusetts. I'm here zooming into Massachusetts, and if you do a functional analysis, you see how different parts of government connect to themselves. But so we have a structure of what government looks like, sort of like in high definition. And then we ask ourselves, uh, what determines the shapes that governments take, at least in the footprint they leave on the web? And the punchline of the paper is that the, the most strongest predictor of a government structure is the structure of the economy. It's not ideological orientation, it's not income, it's not other things, it's the structure of the economy. And that's sort of like the punchline of, of that paper, which suggests that these things have somehow co-evolved, right? That I don't know with which arrow is dominant, but these two things have, have co-evolved. And we find evidence that the complexity of private sector activities is related to the complexity of government activities. So, so then development in this paradigm is very simple. It's the acquisition of letters. So how do you acquire new letters? How do you bring in new letters to your system? So suppose that your system has these seven letters and you want to bring uh, these three extra letters in. How do you get those letters back into, into an economy? And we know that one channel that we've studied a lot is foreign direct investment. Uh, another channel that we studied a lot is migration. If you don't have a particular form of know-how, people can move. Uh, another channel that we've spent a lot of time studying is the role of diasporas. So how can you leverage your diaspora? And the minister of diaspora of Albania is here. Um, uh, studies abroad. Uh, we happen to be at a university here with a bunch of foreign students. Uh, business travel. Business travel is something we've been able to study with the help of, with an alliance with a MasterCard Center for Inclusive Growth. Uh, they've given us data on business travel internationally, and we created sort of like the network of business travel, and we studied, does it matter? Can we observe the consequences of business travel and what happens to the future evolution of uh, exports in, by particular industries? For example, if you get a lot of Germans into your country, is that followed by more exports of cars or chemicals and so on, things that Germany is good at? And that's exactly what, what we find. And, and we can then back those equations that we estimate to ask the question, who would get hurt? Or so how, how, what will be the economic loss if people from one country stopped 
uh, traveling to the other countries. So the countries in green, for example, here is if the US stops traveling, who gets hurt? It's the countries in red. So Canada, um, Latin America, and so on. If Japan stops uh, traveling, the impacted countries are, are somewhat different and, and so on. So that's, that's an ongoing work. It's very exciting, but it shows that you know, in order to do things in the world, you have to move brains around. It's not enough to move information around through emails or FaceTime or whatever. So brains have to move around. How do we facilitate the acquisition of new letters in the public sector? Well, in the, uh, how do we get, say, the more vowels into the system? Well, in the private sector, you have FDI. There's no FDI in governments, right? So people don't, even, don't buy a ministry of education in a country, right? Uh, migration, you typically don't let foreigners be government officials. Uh, diasporas, well, there's no easy way for diasporas to engage. Market incentives to innovate, well, there's really institutional incentives to follow the rules, not to innovate in the public sector. And one of the big works that Lant and Matt have been doing is to like to to expand the scope for innovation in, in the public sector. Studies abroad, well, we hope they come to HKS. <laughs> and business travel, well, maybe that's the reason why so much of international development assistance is about technical cooperation, right? So maybe you can hire some of these guys, and that's why the reason why we travel so much. Maybe that's, that's the way so like some of these letters move around. Uh, we talked in the last two years about the importance for the functioning of the state to have a sense of us, to have a sense of the community for, who, for whom the state is serving. Um, Frank Fukuyama's latest book is on identity, so it's about this creation of a shared sense of us. And that shared sense of us is problematic because a, a, you know, a, a society is successful if it's large enough for it to exploit economies of scale, but also deep enough to agree on a bunch of public goods that have to be provided. Uh, and in, in agreeing, it's complicated by the fact that you know, people in the country may not speak the same language, that people in the country may not have the same religion, that people in the country may not have the same race. But on top of, of those uh, fragmentations in society, you have to have some kind of common sense of us. And then there might be difference in perspectives no, between the globalists and the nativists, if you want. Um, so how did we put together GEM 2019? Well, it's what's the relationship between economic development and state capability? What's the process whereby you accumulate consonants and you accumulate vowels, and how the consonants inform the vowels that you want, and, and vice versa? So we'll have Frank Fukuyama it tells us his, his way of thinking about this, which has been extremely influential in my thinking about it, in terms of thinking not only about the capacity of the state, but also who disciplines the state. What he calls the rule of law is not how the state imposes rules on society, but how the state has to be under the rule of law that constrains what the state does. So it's not just the capacity of the state, but the discipline on what the state is for, and who is the state for, what he calls the accountability of the state. So that's, those are his dimensions of, of political development and, and how it in, impacts uh, economic development. Uh, Ajemoglu and, and Robinson have this book that I'm told is ready for pre-order. <laughs> <laughs> But it's about this co-evolution between, so, so they, they made you know, their book on why nations fail on the idea that institutions determine development. Here you have sort of like a, the growth of, they call it the power of society. You can, might say you know, the, the invisible hand or you know, the, the, the power, in the consonants and the, and the vowels. So, so what's the interaction between these two things? And he's going to talk to us about that. We have Maya Tudor and Daniel Ziblatt, who are going to tell us about state formation, how states were formed in different parts of the world, overcoming these, you know, how do you went from peasant to Frenchman, as a famous book um, um, uh, is, um, is called. Uh, Lan Pritchett and Adnan Khan are going to explain to us, uh, you know, uh, why, why do we get stuck in state capacity. Lant has a fantastic paper uh, um, 
that shows that uh, we've made more progress in economic development than in state capacity. Uh, and uh, he's going to tell us why and how, and how to get unstuck. We're going to hear from Rachel Kleinfeld, who has this fantastic book on why states fail at providing security. Where her answer is not that fails, states fail at providing security because they are weak, but in some sense because they are complicit. Uh, because they have created something that she calls privileged violence. Uh, we're going to hear from Matt Andrews and Jared De Jong, who are going to tell us how to unstuck things. How, how do we get, when we get into a situation where things get stuck, how do we unstuck them? And finally, we're going to hear from uh, three people who have been in government recently, and uh, they inherited a state that was relatively weak and had to do things through that state. So we have Arwen Ahmetai from Albania, Aminata Touré, he was the Minister of Finance of Albania, Aminata Touré was the Prime Minister of Senegal, and Arvin Subramanian was the Chief Economist of uh, the Government of India. So that's what we have ahead of, of us, that's the reason why these topics are there, and that's the reason why I'm so excited that I can stop speaking now and I'm ready to listen to the others, but thank you very much. <laughs>